Hello, everyone, and welcome to the United States Patent and Trademark Office webinar series for experienced practitioners. My name is Marisa Terrell, and I am an attorney in the Trademarks Customer Outreach Office. I'm pleased to serve as your host today. So we conducted some research on the most common refusals issued by our office. Not surprisingly, Trademark Act Section 2D refusals and Trademark Act Section 2E1 merely descriptive refusals ranked high on our list. However, we were somewhat surprised that failure to function refusals are also consistently issued. Today, we will discuss common failure to function refusals, including ornamentation, titles of single works, names of authors and performing artists, not goods in trade, and services rendered for others. Before I introduce our subject matter experts, I'd like to share a few announcements with you. This session is being recorded for your convenience and captioning is available. You will have access to the recording in about three weeks or so by visiting our website, uspto.gov. Today's presentation features a number of terrific slides these slides will be emailed to you after the presentation. At the conclusion of the slide presentation, we'll have time for your questions and you can submit your question using the Q&A box. Simply type your question in and hit enter. Please note that we have a record number of attendees today, so it's possible that we may not get to all the questions. Please bear with us. And finally, please be aware that the chat thread for today has been disabled. It's gonna be used for announcements only. Okay, thanks for allowing me to run through all of those announcements. At this point, I'd like to introduce our two expert presenters. First, we have attorney Jason Lott. Now, Jason is my manager and the managing attorney for trademarks customer outreach here at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Jason specializes in helping small business owners understand trademarks and the federal trademark registration process. He also provides experienced practitioners with the tools and expertise to better serve their clients. Jason began his career at the USPTO in 2000 as a trademark examining attorney and earned his JD from the Dickinson School of Law at Pennsylvania State University and his Bachelor of Arts from Kenyon College and he graduated magna cum laude. We have next attorney Kevin Pesca. Kevin is the managing attorney of the Office of Trademark Quality Review and Training, a position he's held since 2003. Before that, Kevin served as senior and acting managing attorney for Trademark Law Office 111, staff attorney in the Office of the Trademark Commissioner, and a trademark examining attorney. He received his JD in 91 from George Washington University School of Law and his Bachelor of Arts in History in 1988 from the University of Florida. Jason and Kevin, thank you so much. We are ready for you to provide us with an overview of common failure to function refusals. All right, well, thank you very much, Marisa. Hello, everyone. This is what uh, today is going to look like. We're gonna do a very quick overview of what in the world failure to function refusals actually are. Uh, then we're gonna dive into the four different types of refusals that Marisa mentioned. We're gonna hit a couple of really, really quick USPTO resources. And then of course, we're gonna get into your questions. So I'm gonna first lead us off through a little bit of an overview before we get into the refusals. Uh, and so just we can sort of know what this is all about. So often Sometimes we think about uh, as as uh, practitioners and uh, examining attorneys and things uh, of those more traditional types of refusals, our, our regular old Section Two, you know, D and Section Two E types of refusals. But really, there is this other type of refusal that boils down to the question of what in the world a trademark actually is and whether what is being applied uh, to register is actually functioning as a trademark. Uh, so as you can see there, the quote uh, from the from the Magus case, uh, a proposed trademark is registrable only if it functions as an indicator of the source of the applicant's goods and services. Uh, and obviously I don't need to say this to you folks, uh, but you know that's one of the things we always talk about in our trademark basics program is, in, is making sure that folks understand that a trademark is always tied to specific goods and services because it is indicating the source of them. If it is not, 
it is therefore not functioning as a trademark. So let's do a real quick example here before we dive in uh, that really should highlight uh, what we're talking about with these sorts of refusals. Uh, so in this case, in the Magus case, uh, the applicant wanted to register the phrase, drink more beer. So it could be, uh, some people call it a phrase, a slogan, a tagline, really depends on what you want. Uh, and in this case, they were applying to register this slogan for non-metal and non-paper closures for containers. Well, as you can uh, see from the specimen and from the evidence in the case, really what it is is a growler cap. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, growler is kind of like a big old jug, uh, typically filled with beer. Uh, and these are for the caps that are going to go um, on that growler. So you can see, based upon the picture, you see on your screen there, a blue cap. We see the on the cap the phrase, drink more beer. And there's a little design of a, of a mug of beer that's uh, sort of foaming at the top. Uh, so the question here is, based upon the specimen of record, based upon the evidence of record, is drink more beer functioning as a trademark? Well, in this case, the TTAB went through and they looked at everything and they determined, no, it is actually not functioning as a trademark in this case, based upon the evidence of record. And what the TTAB found in that evidence is the fact that the applicant uh, was using this as an example phrase that someone could put on the top of the cap. So people, uh, other, you know, beer uh, brewers would have the opportunity to put a different phrase on there, right? They could put Kevin Pesca Pilsner on there, right? Jason Lot Lager on there, right? If they wanted to, they could put a different design on there if they wanted to. This was really just an example to show um, other folks, hey, if you buy our caps, you can customize them however you want. In addition, uh, on that specimen, it also um, had an indication that if people wanted to save a little cash, they could go ahead and just buy these drink more beer pre-stamp or pre-embossed uh, stock designs of caps. So it was quite clear based upon the evidence of record uh, that here the applicant was not using it as a trademark, but it was really just an example of what you could put on the tops of the caps that they happen to be selling. So it was not indicating the source of caps, it was just something that could be used on a cap. So therefore it is not functioning as a trademark. And really what this is, if we think about it, um, is really a definitional refusal. It's based upon the fact that whatever's being applied to be registered is not actually a trademark, all right? Uh, and that is because it fails to meet uh, the test for what a trademark is. If we think all the way back to the standard oil case from 1960, so I guess at this point we're talking, uh, oh boy, what is that, 63 years uh, is when um, this really started to <laughs> build from there. Uh, the, the statement was really that the Trademark Act is a, not an act to register words, but to register trademarks. And before there can be registrability, there must be a trademark or a service mark, and unless words have been so used, they cannot qualify for registration. And that's really what's happening here is the fact that these words are not being used to indicate source. And the basis for this is section one, two, and 45. Section 45 is really where we find the definitions uh, of, of trademarks. Uh, and for folks that who are thinking about the supplemental register, um, it's sections 23C and section 45, again, of the Trademark Act, because it goes to the definition of what a trademark actually is. So this is stuff that due to its subject matter, uh, it doesn't function to identify source. So how can we tell if something is failing to function? Well, there is no per se rule. It always, always, always is going to boil down to evidence. So what's going to happen is if you were to apply to register a trademark uh, and there's a question of whether or not it fails to function, uh, the examining attorney assigned to your case is, of course, going to be looking at the specimens and also looking at the evidence of record. And so that's mostly going to be the case because most of the time this refusal rears its ugly head uh, is in a Section 1A use in commerce application. So already in the record are going to be specimens um, or, you know, maybe, you know, references to the person's website or, you know, whatever it happens to be. So the examining attorney is going to be looking at all of that stuff. It's not necessarily limited to a Section 1A application, however, and 
there could be a situation where an intent to use application also is potentially triggering a failure to function refusal. Uh, in this case, it might be because the mark drawing is triggering something or maybe the mark description is triggering something. Uh-oh, this is a potential problem here. So in these circumstances, what's going to happen is the examining attorney might, as a courtesy, wave a yellow flag and say, hold on a second here. This looks like there could be a problem here. Uh, but just keep in mind, this is a courtesy only. It's not an actual refusal most of the time. It's just an advisory. Uh, and so the examining attorney is not precluded uh, from raising this as a refusal later on down the line. Oftentimes you'll see this. Uh, I know when I was examining, I would do this as often as I could. I would include an advisory. Hey, uh, just be aware uh, that this is a potential problem here. Uh, you know, kind of flagging it for uh, future discussions. All right. So these are uh, the four that we're going to be talking about today. Ornamentation, title of a single work, name of an artist or an author, and not goods and trade or services for others. And as Marisa indicated, we, were, we did a lot of research before we came up with this because we wanted to be have something that was of the most value to you as practitioners. Uh, and so out of the 40,000 times that fair to function refusals were raised between 2018 and 2022, these are some of them that popped the most. Of course, this is not a an exclusive list. There are things like process or system, functionality, configuration, uh, informational matter, use solely as a trade name, all sorts of other reasons why something might fail to function. Now, the one thing that is missing from this list, and I do want to make sure that we highlight this from the very beginning, the one thing we are not talking about today is the informational matter slash widely used message slash common phrase flavor of fair to function refusal. Uh, and the reason that we're not talking about it today is not because it's uh, unimportant, it is very important. Uh, and actually one of the things that we're working on is putting together a whole webinar that is going to address this topic. There's been a lot of things that have been changing and um, recent cases about it. And so we want to make sure that you are informed with uh, the most information we can possibly give you about how we're treating those sorts of applications. So we're not going to talk about it today. So I'm sure some of you have burning questions about them. <laughs> Absolutely. I think everyone does, right? Uh, but that's not something we're going to cover today. Really, we're focusing on these four refusals. So uh, with that being said, let's jump into actually talking about some of these refusals. Uh, so Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, for you to discuss our first topic, which is uh, the ornamentation flavor of fair to function refusal. Thank you, Jason. So we're going to talk about ornamentation refusals or sometimes called ornamental refusals. And the concept is you can't register decorative features that don't identify the source of goods. And how do we do that? Or what were some of the things we look at to, to determine whether they are decorative features? Ornamentation can take the form of words, slogans, designs, or trade dress. All of these can be determined to be ornamental or receive ornamentation refusal as failure to function. All right, so let's look at some facts that determine registrability. The first is we're going to look at the commercial impression of the uh, mark that's being applied for. Second, and, and in terms of the commercial impression, we're going to look at words, phrases, and, and symbols and determine whether they function as a trademark or whether they are going to receive an ornamentation refusal. Some examples of, of marks that may receive ornamentation refusals would be a peace symbol or a smiley face or the words, I love you. We're also going to look at the size, location, and dominance of the proposed mark. Is the mark neat and neat, small, neat, and discreet? And if in fact it is, that's probably okay and is registrable. On the other hand, if it's emblazoned in large, uh, in a large depiction across the front of, let's say, a T-shirt, that's probably not okay and will receive an ornamentation refusal. All right, let's look at practices of the trade. How are competitors using similar uh, proposed marks in, in the trade? 
If they're using it in an ornamental way, it's probably going to be so that we determine that this proposed mark is going to receive an ornamentation refusal. And if it's only a simple refinement of that practice of, uh, in the trade, again, we're probably going to give an ornamentation refusal because it's not functioning as a mark. However, there are ways to overcome ornamentation refusals, one of which is showing that the mark is, provides secondary source function. And it, we do that by determining whether there's evidence that the proposed mark is perceived as a mark because the applicant is actually using that mark on other goods and trade in commerce. And to, for a couple examples of that, think of the word Nike across a t-shirt or Penn State. We know that those may very well receive ornamentation refusals based just on the, the depiction of those marks on those items. However, it's very likely that both Nike and Penn State are using their mark in commerce on other goods and services in non-ornamental ways, and therefore they can rely on the secondary source function of their present trademark. We're also going to look at evidence of distinctiveness. Generally, five years use is alone is not sufficient to show acquired distinctiveness. You really need to provide concrete evidence of, dis of distinctiveness. And we'll get into all of these a little bit more in a second. Just to give you a couple examples that we'll actually talk about more as we move on, um, is the first is an applicant applied for the phrase, I love you, um, based on uh, jewelry, a jewelry bracelet. And the board in that case found it was merely a term of endearment used by many other jewelers in similar fashions. Similarly, uh, the, we, an applicant applied for the mark Mork and Mindy uh, for decalcomanias or stickers. And that refusal was at a failure to function was actually reversed because the applicant in that case was able to show that it had secondary source function. Okay, let's look at some actual examples, some case law. In this case, the applicant applied for three different designs on clothing, specifically jeans in this case. And, and the, the decision in this case centered on the jean goods. A failure to function for ornamentation refusal was given. And the board in this case affirmed the decision that, this, that these marks only functioned, uh, did not function as trademarks because of the ornamental nature of the marks. The pocket stitching in this case is a prevalent form of ornamentation by others used in the industry. And the dominance and mirror image pattern did not convince the board that uh, this, this functioned as a trademark. And so they affirmed the failure to function refusal. Um, interestingly enough, Examining attorneys can, under Section 66, still refuse as ornamental or as ornamentation, even though specimens are not available in that case. If, in fact, the, the mark on its face is on the drawing page and in the description of the mark is determined to be ornamental in nature, a, a refusal as ornamental can still be given in a 66 uh, case. All right, next. We have the display of a logo on a large display of a logo on the front of a jacket. And in this case, the board also refused the ornamentation refusal. They decided that it was really just a single line, single piping design uh, displayed across the front of the jacket. And in the practice, that is something that many other uh, users also, uh, how they displayed similar decorations. The size of the design and the dominance of the location of the design were strong factors in deciding that this was only ornament, ornamental use. And in fact, the fact that there were other registrations uh, with other large displays were, was not controlling for the board because every case needs to be looked at on a case by case basis. And in this case, the evidence of secondary source could not be used because the applicant provided, did not provide uh, examples of use in commerce of the same mark, but actually showed a different mark. So they were not be, they were not able to rely on secondary source 
of, as a way of overcoming the ornamentation refusal. All right. In this case, the phrase, I love you, was, was applied for bracelets. And the board again affirmed the refusal as ornamentation. They essentially said that it's just a term of endearment that many people use uh, in the industry on similar uh, jewelry. Uh, it's common practice to do so. And it's and, it, and the fact that there's numerous third party examples of other jewelers using it was, was swayed the board to decide that the ornamentation refusal was apt. And so they did affirm the refusal in this case. All right, so what are the, some, of the, uh, some of the options that you can use to overcome an ornamentation refusal? Well, there are several. The first and most obvious way is to submit a different specimen showing trademark use in a non-ornamental fashion. Second, you can show acquired distinctiveness. Again, five years use is generally not sufficient to, sh to show acquired distinctiveness and actual concrete evidence of distinctiveness has to be provided. We've mentioned secondary source. Um, uh, first, let me say that you can amend to the supplemental register. Um, so if the mark is capable of, of serving as a trademark, you can amend to the supplemental register and proceed on those grounds. And again, we, we've talked about secondary source. There are several ways in which you can show secondary source. The first is ownership of a section one uh, registration on the principal register for other goods and services. The idea here is that the mark, you are showing that the mark, the proposed mark does function as a trademark and you are only using the, the applied for mark here to show secondary source and so it does function as a trademark itself. Second, you can provide uh, evidence of ownership of a section 44 or section 66 registration as long as an affidavit or declaration of use has been filed for that, for that registration. Again, showing that actual use uh, as a trademark is shown. You can also show non-ornamental use of the mark on other goods and services. So evidence of other use of, the, of, of that mark on other goods and services functioning as a trademark in a non-ornamental way. And finally, you can also show ownership of a pending application under Section 1A, again, that's showing the mark used in a non-ornamental fashion on other goods and services. And of course, last, you can amend to Section 1B, uh, intent to use application, as long as the mark is capable, but you don't have su uh, sufficient use at this point. All right, so what are some takeaways that we can look at? First of all, you wanna look at third-party use of the trademark. As in our I love you mark, you wanna see how other people are using the mark. Similarly to the Lululemon, the large display of the mark across the front of the jacket, how are other people in the industry using that mark? If they're using it in an ornamental way, there's a good chance that your application may be refused as failing to function as ornamental as well. What you want to do is research whether cu customers are accustomed to seeing similar ornamental displays. Again, similar to third party use of the trademark, how are the customers used to seeing your proposed mark? If it's in an ornamental way, there's a likelihood that you will get an ornamentation refusal in your case as well. And finally, when we talk about secondary source, it's really important to note that the use has to be non-ornamental on the other goods and services. It can't just be further ornamental use on other goods and services, but rather non-ornamental use on different goods and services. All right, well, let's look at an actual example and see what we think. Let's say that you or your client are applying for the mark, you are special today for plates. And you can see that on the this depiction of the plate, Around the rim is the wording, you are special. Think for a second whether you feel the office would give an ornamentation refusal in this case. And what is the answer here? 
In fact, this was found to be ornamental, merely ornamental use. The fact is that the way the depiction on the plate in the industry is is found to be ornamental and decorative in nature and does not have trademark significance. So this the board re actually affirmed the refusal of this uh, proposed mark. And that brings us to title of a single work for, uh, refusals, and I'm going to throw this back to Jason. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin. All right, folks. So here we're going to talk through uh, title of a single work. And the concept here really is that you cannot register the title of a single creative work. Uh, and again, and the reason for this is because the title of a single creative work is not functioning as a trademark. It's just telling you the name of that work. Uh, and a lot of this comes from a sort of policy reasons comes stems from copyright law and the fact that a copyright term can end and a trademark registration can last forever. So what would we do in a situation where the copyright enters the copyrighted work enters into the public domain, but the trademark was still uh, in existence. That means that people wouldn't be able to call that work by its name uh, because somebody else still has that locked up as the indicator of source of that particular single creative work. And the other reason really is that when we're talking about a title, we're just, it's, it's allowing people to know what the name of the thing is. It is not necessarily associated with, in the public's mind, with the provider of that work. So if we think about a movie, I don't know, one that like uh, everything, everywhere, all at once, right? You know, if we hear the name of an Oscar winning movie, do we automatically know who the producer was or who the uh, production company was or who the distributor was? No, not necessarily. It's just the title of that particular work It is not indicating the source of that work. So in addition to the idea of the of a title of a single work not being registrable, also be aware that you cannot register a portion of the title uh, uh, of a single creative work. Uh, now, there are ways to overcome this, and we're going to talk through what those are. But if you just have a single creative work, um, or you're trying to register a portion of a title of a single creative work, uh, then it will be refused registration. So let's talk through some more uh, specifics. We're going to focus first on registrability um, with regard to the complete title of a single work. So uh, what are the factors that are going to determine whether or not you can register in this case? So what's going to happen is uh, you apply to register a title of a single creative work and you're saying, oh, no, no, examining attorney. Look, I have all this sort of other evidence of all these other versions of this single creative work. Well, the examining attorney is going to look to see, does the content change significantly, significantly from version to version uh, that you are submitting as part of your evidence? In addition, uh, the examining attorney is going to look to see whether the title is being used on a series of works, right? So at that point, it's not just the title of a single creative work, but it's actually the title of a series of works. And in that case, that is something that can help overcome that refusal. Uh, another thing that might factor into it is whether it is actually not a single creative work, right? That kind of gets us around the whole refusal at that point when you're saying, hey, uh, it can't be refused title of a single creative work because it is technically not a single creative work. We're going to look at some examples of what that actually means. Uh, and then we're going to dig into uh, the idea of portion of a title of a single work because there are a couple additional wrinkles uh, that come into play when trying to register one of those as a, uh, as a trademark. So let's talk about what a single creative work actually is, okay? To give us a sort of baseline of what we're talking about when we're thinking about single creative works. It could be something like a book, uh, serialized writing, right? I think Charles Dickens was often famous for that. You know, he would serialize his, his, his writings and they would come out in the papers and, uh, but altogether that's one single creative work. It was just kind of spread out over time. Could be a sound recording or a downloadable song or maybe a downloadable ringtone. Maybe it's a film or a single radio program or a single television program. Maybe it's a play or, the, or a musical, right? A scripted theatrical performance. These are all things that we consider to be 
single creative works. And the reason is that the content isn't changing from, you know, uh, like what an, an, an early version of the book to a slightly edited version of the book, uh, like an old edition to a new edition, right? Uh, same thing with a uh, scripted theatrical performance. Uh, the content doesn't really change uh, from one performance to another. Now, obviously, it's going to be a little bit different depending upon the, the actor and the responses that you're going to get from the audience. Uh, but the um, script is going to be the same. The action is going to be the same. The music is going to be the same. Uh, and so it's not really changing from performance to performance. So these are the sorts of things that we consider to be single creative works. Um, now, here's some things that we don't consider to be single creative works. Uh, so it is not a single creative work if it is a magazine or a newsletter or a comic book or a guidebook or a piece of printed classroom material or maybe computer software or a computer game or a coloring book or an activity book, even a live musical performance, right? Let's contrast that with a scripted uh, performance. This is like a live concert or something like that. So these are not considered to be single creative works. All right. So in that case, if what you are applying to register as a title of one of these things, you could make the argument, hey, it is not a single creative work. Uh, so, and by the way, uh, you have probably seen this on every one of these slides. But you can see the site to the TMEP section down at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, so if you have any questions about these and you want to look up more cases that have to do with these sorts of things, you can always check out the TMEP site at the bottom of every single slide. Uh, so, so this is an argument you can make and you can say, hey, it's not a single creative work. Uh, it's actually a volume one and a volume two or something like that. That's going to be the case with our magazines and newsletters, comic strips, uh, stuff like that. So let's take a look at an example of a single uh, uh, title of a single work. So in this case, Brainy Baby registered Laugh and Learn uh, for their uh, pre-recorded audio visual materials. Well, Mattel says, hey, uh, boy, uh, I uh, would also uh, like to register uh, Laugh and Learn. And it doesn't appear that you are actually using this on a series of creative works. And so they went to the board to get this all sorted out. And so in this case, the board agreed with Mattel and canceled the registration for Laugh and Learn because there was no evidence that Brainy Baby was using using Laugh and Learn as, uh, as the title of a series of these videos. And so what did they do to help figure this out? They looked at the evidence. And the board went through and looked at what was on the DVD, compared it to what was on the VHS tape, and determined these are essentially, it's essentially the same work, they're just delivered in two different formats. And this was true even though the DVD, right, which was, you know, 2011, yeah, you know, uh, or earlier, right, that was pretty uh, splashy technology at the time, you know, it had like a little scene selection menu, uh, like maybe a little making of, had some bloopers, you know, advertisements, you know, uh, uh, you know, a DVD act, uh, ROM activity file, They're like yes, others oh, things going on there, but not enough to really make a difference because the bulk of the content was the same regardless of a DVD or whether it's on a VHS tape. And so there's 45 minutes of programming. It's pretty much the same uh, regardless of uh, the format. So in this case, the board said there is no evidence that Laugh and Learn is being used for a title of a series of audiovisual materials, so therefore the registration must be canceled. All right, let's take a look at another example. This is for the trademark Instant Keyboard. Uh, and in this case, it was for, as you might guess, uh, music instruction books for self-learning on electronic keyboards. And in this case, the TTAB also found that it was a title of a single creative work. There was no evidence that was used on a series of Instant Keyboard books. There was only use of instant keyboard um, on, the, on the specimen itself, appearing on the cover of the book, on the spine of the book, and also on the first page of the book. And so it was quite clear to the board that in this case, instant keyboard was not functioning as a trademark. It was functioning as the title of this single creative work. So that's title of a, com a complete title of a single creative work. Let's take a peek at how it changes a little bit when we're talking about a portion of a title of a single work. Uh, so one way to, to really kind of think about this might be 
Star Wars. Okay, Star Wars comes out in 1977. Uh, it is the title of a single creative work, right, of the movie, right? So probably that is going to be refused registration if they had tried to register it at that time for a, you know, um, you know, uh, motion picture film. Uh, however, times have changed since 1977, and Star Wars is no longer just the name of that first movie, but is now used as a series, right? So we then, that got renamed as A New Hope, and then we also have Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, we have the prequels, we have the post quills i guess you know the the sequel trilogy that uh that sort of uh that ends the skywalker saga we also have star wars being used to indicate a series of other sorts of works tv shows right uh clone wars the bad batch mandalorian book of boba fett uh you know things along that side right you have standalone movies like rogue one or solo a star wars story plus you have comic like of all this other stuff right you can see where star wars is being used to indicate the source of a series of creative works so it can work this way um, if it the the what you're trying to register is creating a separate commercial um, impression apart from the complete title. It is also being used on a series of works and it is also promoted or recognized as a mark for the series. I mean, shoot, you open up Disney Plus, you can see there's a little box right there that's like Star Wars, right? So you can go click and get all the Star Wars content that you could ever want to consume all in one place. So you can see how something like Star Wars uh, could originally start off as a title of a single creative work, but then it becomes used to indicate a series, right? Or, or even a portion of a title uh, that refers to a series of works. Same thing could be true for Harry Potter, right? Here, first Harry Potter comes out, Harry Potter and uh, the uh, Sorcerer's Stone, right? So at that point, probably that portion of Harry Potter is uh, just part of a larger title of a single creative work. But then when you start to have, uh, you know, Chamber of Secrets, Prisoner of Azkaban, you know, and so forth, uh, you're starting to see it being used and, and promoted as a title of a series of works. All right, so let's look again at some examples. Uh, so let's look at some actual TTAB examples. So what about this case here? We have the magic school bus uh, being applied uh, for to register for a series of nonfiction picture books uh, for children. Uh, you can see the magic school bus is the trademark uh, in this case. I just kind of pulled a couple of examples there. Uh, the, the, in the actual case, it was magic school bus uh, at the waterworks and magic school bus inside the earth, uh, but you get the point, it's kind of a series. So in this case, the TTAB said, yes, this is fine. It is actually uh, creating this separate commercial impression uh, from each title. It is being used on a series of books. And in addition, they found that there was evidence that Scholastic was promoting the Magic School Bus as a series title, right? So in this case, the Magic School Bus, even though it's just a portion of a title, is still indicating the source of this series of books. All right, so let's talk about some ways to potentially overcome the refusal if you were to get one. Well, I think the quickest and easiest way is probably, if you can, to submit evidence that you have a series of creative works. Hey, USPTO, uh, it is not just a, one single creative work, it is this series. You can see the example there on the right. You have a couple of CDs there by the artist Blatancy. Uh, Blatancy is going to come up in the next section that Kevin is going to talk about. This one is purely about the refusal that was issued by the examining attorney for blatancy uh, as a title of a single creative work. Well, in this case, uh, the artist, uh, Blatancy, um, overcame it by showing, hey, uh, I actually use it on two different CDs. And there was some other evidence that's in the liner notes and things like that, uh, that potentially this is a series of creative works um, with the name blatancy indicating the source of those. Right. So you could also, for example, uh, submit evidence that the goods are not a single creative work. That's one way to get around it for sure. Uh, and another would be to delete the goods and services from the identification. Right, That can happen where uh, something is fine to uh, be used as a brand name for some other item, uh, but boy, it's getting a refusal because it's indicating the source because it's the title of your book. Well, you could actually delete books out of there and you'd probably be all right, so long as the mark is being used in other ways to indicate the source of those other goods and services. 
And of course, another option would be to amend down to section 1B and tend to use basis, uh, knowing that later on you're going to have good usage and you can come back later and say, hey, look, uh, it is a series. Keep in mind in these situations, though, that we're going to be talking about all day today with these when you're amending down to 1B and then hoping to come back up to 1A later on. Uh, keep in mind, this is not like, oh, let me just like put something together real quick for a specimen. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about legit use here, okay? Uh, so that's always going to be the case where you need to show legit use uh, for all of these things in order to overcome the refusals. So a couple of quick uh, pro tips here, a couple of takeaways. Uh, remember that trademarks do pr provide protection for brands, uh, not creative works. Uh, sometimes people do get those confused. Happens in uh, presentations I give all the time. People will always say, hey, I want to you know, trademark the patent on my copyright or copyright that patent on my trademark. And people really get confused about the intellectual property uh, that is being protected here. And so obviously you're going to want to make sure your clients are aware, hey, we're talking brand name slogans and logos here. That's what we're talking about creating uh, through a federal trademark registration, not protection for the creative work itself. Also want to point out, you cannot amend to SUP or do uh, an, a claim of Section 2F acquired distinctiveness in this case, uh, because it's not functioning as a trademark here, uh, right, because it needs to be used on a series um, of the single creative works, something like that. So you can't amend in these cases. You can amend down to 1B, but you can't claim 2F or go on the SUP. All right, real quick knowledge check here. Again, uh, you, you don't need to put any answer into the Q&A. This is purely for you to think about. Uh, let me explain what's going on in this particular case, uh, and then you can decide for yourself whether you think the, accept, uh, the specimen is acceptable, uh, tra shows trademark, acceptable trademark use. So the applicant applied to register the brain that changes itself and the specimens that were submitted uh, by the applicant. By the way, these are for printed materials, books, and instructional manuals uh, on the subjects of the human brain, brain science, and neuroplasticity. So here, uh, what you see on the right-hand side there it might be a little bit hard to see because it's kind of washed out. Uh, but we see two specimens on both of those creative works. We see the brain that changes itself. The one in the back you can see is a hardcover. The one in the front is an audio book. And so I think you probably already know the answer to that, and that is no. Uh, that is does not evidence of acceptable trademark use. It is the same content, just in different formats. It does not show use on a series of works. All right. So that's the first two. Uh, we're going to talk through uh, two more before we get into your questions. So Kevin, I'm going to flip it back to you so you can talk through names of artists and authors. Thank you, Jason. Well, let's talk about the concept of artists and author refusals as failure to function. The first is that you cannot register the name of an author on a written work if it's used solely to identify the author of that work. Second, you cannot register the name of a performing artist on a sound recording if, again, if it's used solely to identify the artist in that case. All right, let's look at some factors that will determine whether it's this proposed mark is registrable. First, we're going to look and see, as we did with title of single works, whether there's evidence of a series of works. So that's the first step in determining whether this proposed mark will does function uh, and will not and can overcome an artist and author's refusal. The second thing we're going to look at is evidence of whether the name identifies the source of the series. And we do that in a couple of different ways. One, we look to see whether the applicant has promoted uh, the name of the mark and whether there's recognition of the name uh, and the proposed mark. Um, or we're going to look to see whether they can show control over the nature and quality of the goods in this case. We're going to get into that a little bit deeper now. Here's an example of the uh, in which a name of artist uh, refusal was given because there was an because the mark, as you saw in earlier in the title of a single work presentation that Jason gave, the the mark was blatancy in this case, and they were the goods were audio recordings featuring music, as well as musical entertainment services providing live musical performances. And the important thing here was, first of all, is that no refusal is given to the services. 
it is only the goods that receive this refusal. So, so keep that in mind that the fact that they were using this on musical entertainment services, that would not receive a refusal. The refusal only applied to the audio recordings re featuring music. And it was determined that it, that it merely identified the feature performer. And the, and the board did affirm the refusal here. Basically, they said that there was not enough evidence given to show that the applicant in this case controlled the nature and quality of the goods. Um, in addition, they provided no evidence that they promoted and the, mark, and the proposed mark was recognized as the source of those goods. Basically, the fact is that in this case, they couldn't show either through promotion or evidence of control that they did control the nature and quality of the goods in this case, and that it was, in fact, uh, more than just a series. That's all of the two-step test that they were able to provide in this case. So again, the mark in this case, the refusal was affirmed. Okay, let's look at another example. In this case, the name of an author refusal was given. The mark in this case was Cecil Adams. And the mark was used in, in relation to a newspaper column. They were, as with the blatancy mark, able to show an evidence of a series of writings. So they did fulfill that first part of the test. However, the refusal was affirmed in this case because they were not able to show either through promotion or control of the quality and, and nature of the mark uh, that, that it was, that it did in fact function as a trademark. Essentially, the board said that the name of each column indicated just an author byline and nothing more. It did not have source indicating, uh, um, it did not indicate the source of the goods in this case. All right, well, what do we do when we do receive an author or artist refusal? What are the ways of overcoming that refusal? There certainly are, and that's good. First of all, you can submit evidence that it's a series of works. Remember, that's the first part of the test. So you need to show that the, that the mark is being used on a series of works and that the name identifies the source of that good. The second part is that the name identifies the source of that, that those goods. And we can do that again in two ways. One, we can show that there's evidence that the performer in this case controls the quality and, and uh, nature of the goods. They can do that through license agreements, contractual agreements that show production and quality control of the goods, or they can, in this case, provide a verified statement or affidavit that the applicant publishes or produces the goods in this case, and in, the, in fact, they control the quality of the goods in that case. So the, the two steps are, again, one, that you show that it's a series of marks, and two, that you show that the name identifies a source through control of quality and nature of the goods. Another way of overcoming the refusal is to, as with others, amend to a Section 1B intent to use basis. Of course, eventually you are going to have to show good use, or as Jason said, legit use. Uh, and, and so at some point, you still will have to show that, it, that you can overcome this refusal through the, that two-step uh, test. You can also, in this case, amend to the supplemental register because you can say that it's capable of eventually becoming a trademark eventually after it, it, you're able to pass the two-part test. All right. So what are some takeaways here? First of all, the refusal applies to pseudonyms as well. So not just the actual name of an author but or artist, but the pseudonym they may be using would still receive an author or artist refusal if that's the, the sole use of, it, of the mark. Next, the refusal does not apply to services. We talked about that before. So if someone comes in for musical sound recordings, as well as um, live performances, uh, entertainment services, namely live per musical performances, they'll receive the refusal for the musical sound recordings, but they won't receive the refusal for the entertainment services because it does not apply to services. Next, 
It does not apply to the to original works of art. And what are original works of art? Paintings, murals, sculptures, statues, jewelry, even. Um, the mar the refusal does not apply to those original um, works of art. And finally, you cannot claim Section 2F acquired distinctness. While you can apply to the uh, for the uh, registration under the supplemental register, you cannot attempt to show acquired distinctiveness for this refusal. Uh, because basically, um, if you're not able to, to show that both steps of that test are satisfied, it's still not functioning as a mark, and, and it's impossible to show that it would have acquired distinctiveness. All right, well, let's look at an example. In this case, the applicant applied for the mark Fern Michaels on a series of books, a series of fictional books. And it was given a refusal as an, merely an author. Uh, so it was given a failure to function refusal. And the, the applicant in this case provided a good amount of evidence to show that they did promote the mark, uh, the name as an actual trademark. In this case, they had shown that the author's name was used for 30 years, that there were 67 separate books of, of works that they created under the same name that sold uh, approximately 6 million copies, that the book jackets listed the titles of the books uh, that the author had created, and that they promoted the, the, the author as a best-selling author. They also showed that the author had been inducted into the New Jersey Literary Hall of Fame, and they actually showed that the author had a website under its name, uh, fernmichaels.com. However, all of that evidence was not persuasive in this case, and the board affirmed the refusal that this was mer merely an author. Essentially, they said that the evidence of promotion was indirect and rather scant in this case, and essentially that it had um, that there was no documentary evidence that the author controlled the quality of the goods, and that the limited evidence that they did provide. To, to show promotion of the of the mark uh, for of the proposed mark for Michaels was not sufficient. What they didn't do, which the board would have liked to have seen, is to see third party reviews uh, using the, the name Fern Michaels. Um, information regarding advertising and promotional uh, numbers uh, in relation to use of the of the mark Fern Michaels. Nor did they show declarations from publishers, retailers, or purchasers that they recognized the, the proposed mark Fern Michaels as the source of these goods. And that brings us to our final uh, type of failure to function refusal, goods and trade and services for others. And this is, will again be presented by Jason. All right. Well, these are pretty similar in concept, uh, whether something is a good in trade or a service provided for others. And it's kind of a different way of thinking about the fair to function variety of refusals. Because before, if we're thinking about, oh, what is the trademark? And, you know, what are the goods and services that are being used with? And is there evidence that is being used to actually indicate the source of those things? What we're talking about here is, these aren't even goods, okay? These aren't even services. And so therefore it is going to fail to function uh, because the goods that have been listed or the services that have been listed in the application um, are not actually things uh, that, are, that are used in trade uh, and so therefore cannot be um, actual products. And so therefore the def it would fail the definitional test. So it can um, apply to, to either one, whether it's uh, a trademark is not a good in trade or it is an activity that is not performed for others. And we're going to take a look at both of these things with an example uh, of each to try and drive this home a little bit. So uh, let's talk about some of the factors that do determine whether something could be registrable um, because, it, you know, if it's a good in trade and we have to ask the question, does the good that is being listed in the application have utility to others? And so if it is only existing to help customers obtain the applicant's primary good or service, it's probably not a good in trade. Or is it so inextricably tied to the primary good or service that it doesn't have any existence otherwise? 
Another way to think about it would be to ask the question, is it sold separately? Does it have independent value apart from whatever the applicant's primary good or service might be? So in some ways you're looking at the sort of negative side of it, uh, the first two there, and then the other you're taking a more positive look about, oh, maybe this is um, a good in trade. So it's really going to be a factual determination that is made on a case-by-case -case basis. And again, uh, we can't emphasize this enough. It is always going to be evidence-based. For all of these issues, it's always going to be evidence-based and what is actually going to be found in the record. So uh, let's take a look here and talk about things that are not considered goods in trade. Your letterhead, an invoice, a report that you pump out boxes that your stuff comes in, a business form, a checkbook, a brochure, a pamphlet, a mock-up, a holiday greeting card that you send from your company. These are not technically goods in trade because these are things uh, that are just part and parcel of whatever service it is that you provide um, or it's, uh, you know, the sort of thing that surrounds its packaging or something like that it is not an actual physical thing uh, that you perhaps sell. Now, I know you might look at some of these things and say, uh, Jason, excuse me, what if I happen to be um, a printer uh, and my business is making holiday greeting cards? Well, yeah, sure. In that case, okay, right? It probably would be. Those are goods that you provide. However, if you are uh, a tax preparation company and you're sending out a holiday greeting card, you know, around the December holidays to say, don't forget us in a couple of months, we're here to do your taxes, right? You know, so that sort of stuff, that's not actual good that's being provided. Um, you know, it's just a way to keep, <laughs> keep you in top of mind uh, that some people might want to have your services. Same thing would be true for a checkbook. So let's say that you are a printer and part of what you pump out as a printer um, is a checkbook that you're making for various banks. Well, in that case, maybe, yeah, that would be considered a good. However, if you are a bank, like in the Bank of America case, uh, which uh, this example comes from, there, uh, having a checkbook is really just sort of part and parcel of <laughs> having, a, having a banking relationship uh, because that is how you interact with the bank. Uh, you're writing a check or, or something along those lines. Okay, so, so there's sort of like the necessary tools uh, that, are, that are part and parcel of you providing your service. All right, so, so that's goods. Um, so uh, we're gonna take a look at services, then I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. All right, so with regard to services, again, it's kind of that same concept, that same line of thinking. So if we're thinking about whether something actually even is a service, we have to ask the question, is it a real activity? Is it performed for the benefit of others? And is it sufficiently distinct from your primary or your principal activity? And so what we're looking for are all of these things to decide whether or not something actually is a service. It's got to be real, <laughs> something you're doing. It's got to be something performed for the benefit of others. And it's got to be distinct from the other sorts of things that you do and not sort of like tied into it. Like, uh, oh, well, I, you know, I'm a, I manufacture uh, car parts and I, and, you know, and so shipping would not be uh, an activity that's distinct from your thing of making the goods because you got to get them to people somehow. And the way you're doing it is perhaps through shipping them. Okay, so let's think about things that are not services provided for others. Uh, it could be a concept or an idea. That is not a service, okay? Having a concept or having an idea, that is not actually a service that you provide for others. Same thing with a system or a process uh, or a method. Those aren't really services being provided for others. That might be part of a service that you provide, Right? So you might have a way of doing something. Oh, when you order cookies from us, we have a, sp a specific process that we use for, okay. Well, no one is buying that from you. They're buying cookies from you, okay? They're hiring you to do a custom uh, cupcake cake or whatever, you know, I don't know, uh, whatever it is. So apparently I'm very hungry right now. Uh, so so it, it, providing a system or process or method is not actually a service that you provide for others. Same thing with your intranet website. Right. This is an internal facing thing. This is just for you and your employees uh, to, you know, to, you know, pass around information and to post whatever and allow people to submit timesheets, whatever it is they do through your internet website. That is not a service that you are providing for your customers. 
Same thing with soliciting investors. You know, trying to raise money for your company is not a service that you provide for others. It is something that you are doing for your business. Same thing with advertising or promoting your own goods, uh, performing trials on your own goods. Look, you know, let's hope you're performing those trials before you get that pharmaceutical out there, right? Uh, before you talk to the FDA or whoever. Uh, okay, and also publishing your own periodical, not a service for others, okay? Something that you are doing on your own for your own stuff is not technically a service. All right, so let's look at an example to try and make this more concrete. So in this case, what we have here uh, is this trapezoidal thing on the right-hand side. It turns out it is a box that is a point-of-sale container for toys, games, and playthings. Uh, in this case, it was uh, puzzles, uh, a toy laptop, uh, and also maybe uh, packaging for a, a doll. Okay, uh, so the question was, are these boxes an actual good in trade. And you can see by the little red X up there that the TTAB determined, no, these are not goods in trade uh, because they are part of, they're sort of like the packaging for the goods. They're the things that the goods come in, right? That is why they are there. Uh, they are um, how you get the product safely uh, to the customer for them to purchase. Now, in this case, uh, MGA Entertainment had made an argument, hey, but, you know, these things can be used for other purposes. For example, you know, this is a box that the laptop comes in. It is part of the child's play world. They can pretend like they're mommy or daddy, and they have it in a briefcase, and they're taking it off to work. Well, the board said, no, not really. This is just... Uh how the the thing is 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 sent much in the same way uh that a uh shoe box uh might have other utility or you could use it for other things a shoe box is just what the shoes come in a bag that your coffee comes in well that's just a bag that your coffee comes in uh it is uh part of like the packaging for the good so the lap the play laptop might be a good a puzzle might be a good the box that it comes in not a good because for puzzles, at the very least, you got to put it in something. And that's what was happening here. So really, the boxes are incidental to the primary goods. And also, they were not separately marketed as carrying cases. So that could maybe be a way, uh, you know, around it to make the to make the argument, oh, oh, yes, stuff comes in this. But also, look, it has its own play thing, right? Somebody could purchase this carrying case on its own empty and then use it to put in their toy laptop or then use it to put in puzzle pieces or then use it to put in a doll or shoes or coffee or whatever it happens to be. All right, so that's goods, all right? Let's take a real quick look here at services for others. Uh, in this case, this was, uh, the trademark was Say It Your Way. Uh, and as you can see in the example on the right-hand side there, this was their specimen. Uh, this was a screenshot from their Twitter page. Uh, and the services that they listed in the application were for creating an online community for registered users to participate in discussions get feedback from their peers, form communities, and engage in social networking featuring information on flowers, floral products, and gifts. So that's where they're saying their services are, and they su submitted this as their specimen. Well, in this case, it was refused, uh, and the TTAB um, affirmed that refusal and said essentially, uh, creating a social media account uh, does not create an online community. Uh, I guess the way to think about it would be Twitter, or whatever social media platform it happens to be, is the one who is creating the online community. You might have a page there, which allows you to interact with other people and get messages and you know send out, hey, we've got a, a new thing uh, of flowers available, and for people to message you, oh my goodness, that arrangement was so fabulous, thank you so much, it's so beautiful, I have it on my kitchen counter, whatever, right? Um, so there's that stuff, you know, so that is sort of happening inside a community, but it is not a service that is being created by the applicant in this case. And in addition, the board decided that using a, a social media account to advertise and promote your business is not a service that's provided for others. Because if we think about it, if we think about how Twitter and, and other social media platforms are used uh, by companies, oftentimes it is about them trying to get information out about a deal that they have going on or something along those lines. It's saying, hey, we're available for whatever your floral needs might be, right? It is less about, I mean, yes, there is communication that's happening, Social media allows a back and forth, but in many ways it is about advertising and promoting the business, uh, not 
creating an online community. All right, so uh, let's take a look at some ways to overcome the refusal. Uh, one way would be to, uh, again, delete the goods or services, right? So if the refusal is only as to uh, these particular things, then one way to get past it would just be to delete those and go ahead with whatever good or service that's still remaining in the application that did not get that refusal. Another way would be to submit evidence that the goods have utility apart from promotional use. Uh, this here is this is a snap-on case. Uh, it's a rather old case uh, from, uh, as you can see there, from 1968. Uh, and in this case, uh, the snap-on trademark uh, was being applied to these ballpoint pens. And here the TTAB said, yeah, that's okay. All right, yes, these are promotional things, right? That Snap-on is gonna send out, you know, so repair shops and whatever have, always have a pen on hand to, you know, write up an invoice, whatever it happens to be. But here, the thing is that these goods have another utilitarian purpose. They're a ballpoint pen. Right. So here, because they have this utilitarian function and Snap-on was selling these pens like in bulk to their franchise dealers, uh, they sub, you know, transport them in commerce across state lines. Uh, they are actually going to uh, essentially be goods that were then used in interstate commerce. So the two big examples are going to be ballpoint pens or any sort of pen, I guess, and also calendars. Those are kind of the big examples that are typically out there of those sorts of things that are they're clearly kind of promotional, but they also do have an additional function. And so that might be um, a way to overcome that refusal. And for services, just make sure that it is real, performed for others, and it is sufficiently distinct from the other sorts of things that you're doing. And of course, you can always uh, amend down to section 1B, intent to use basis. So a couple of pro tips as we uh, finish out here and we get into your questions. Um, always think about it from the customer's point of view. So if you are the customer, what is the primary thing that you're thinking that the applicant is providing, right? So think about what is it your client is actually doing, right? Is the other stuff just like kind of part of that or it's like, you know, it's not a distinct service that someone could e that somebody could hire them to perform? Or no, it's just, you know, this is what we do. We, you know, part of our thing is that we deliver it to your door. You know, you know, what I don't know, uh, right? So what is the primary good of the primary uh, service? Also keep in mind, you cannot amend this up and you cannot claim 2F uh, in this case. You can, however, amend to section 1B uh, and wait to have good use uh, and then submit that, you know, through your statement of use. Okay, real quick knowledge check as we get out of here. Uh, so in this case, uh, let's say that you are uh, applying to register RX Guardian, uh, and this is for printed reports featuring medical laboratory results provided to medical practitioners for record keeping purposes. All right, so in this case, it was, uh, for, it was sort of like drug testing services and also included, you know, are these things like, oh, uh, we have these reports. So the question is, are reports goods in trade and you see the specimen provided there on the right hand side it's a little small don't worry you don't need to read everything that's on there you can see uh it is rx guardian report is up at the top there and the question is is this acceptable trademark use again don't have to put it in the q a keep it to yourself and the answer is no it is not the report is just the conduit through which the applicant provides information to the person that hired them Hey, you want us to do some medical testing for you? Okay, here's the report that says how these people did or something along those lines, all right? So again, it's not an actual good, right? It is part of the service that is being provided. So therefore, it is not a good in trade. All right, so we have a couple of USPTO resources uh, to point out. And so Kevin is gonna walk you through a couple of these and then we're going to move on to questions. Great, thank you, Jason. And of course, you know most of these resources, but just in case, we just want to go over them where you can turn for further information. The first is our website, USPTO.gov, and it provides a wealth of information, including trademark videos, basic facts about trademarks, the Trademark Information Network, and T's nuts and bolts uh, information. And in these include how to respond to office actions. And of course, you all know the Trademark Manual of Examining Procedure, where we find the guidance that you would seek to deal with these refusals. Uh, 
you can see here in a picture of, of our website and including the responding to office actions feature. Um, and again, a wealth of information here. And here are the specific TMEP sections um, regarding the refusals that we talked about today. Most of them are in the 1202 uh, section of the TMEP, but you can see the last one, Services for Others, is in 1301. And there are additional failure to function refusals, which we did not talk about today. And you can find those at these uh, TMEP sections. Uh, again, these are failure to function refusals that are less common than those we talked about today, but you can certainly find out about them by looking at these TMEP sections. And that leads us to our question uh, time. Marisa? Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing so much great information on common failure to failure to function refusals. Uh, so if you're interested in reviewing these slides again, you're in luck because a link to the slides is already in the chat and will be emailed to you at 3.30, around 3.30 today via Eventbrite. So at this point, let's, let's hear from you, our attendees. Um, if you haven't already done so, go ahead and submit your question to the Q&A box. Um, we're going to try our best to answer them. Um, before we start, though, let's go over a few ground rules just to govern our Q&A discussion. Please remember, we cannot provide legal advice. So this means that we can't comment on the registrability of any marks, including the validity of any registrations, and we can't address any specific identifications contained in live applications because those are still in examination. All right, we've got one great question. We're going to start with um, Kevin. This is, I think this is the topic is ornamentation here. So here's the question. You mentioned that one way to overcome an ornamentation refusal is by showing evidence of secondary source. We talked about that. So what types of evidence can I use to show that secondary source? And then is it the same kind of evidence that I would use to show acquired distinctiveness? Thank you, Marisa. Um, the type of evidence you would use is again, use of the mark on other goods and services in a non-ornamental fashion. So that could be any evidence of that. To use the, an example that we talked about uh, earlier, the Penn State example that was used on a t-shirt. Um, how you want, would want to show secondary source is perhaps showing a, a website that showed that Penn State was used for educational services. It was being used in a non-ornamental fashion on other goods and services. It does not have to rise to the level of evidence that you would need to show acquired distinctiveness. You merely have to show the mark being used in a non-ornamental fashion on other goods and services. Uh, and, and usually that means a, a specimen uh, that does not have to be verified. It's purely used as evidence showing that mark used in that manner. Okay, I think that that was a, a, a great answer for that question. Um, you know, Kevin, I like talking with you. How about one more in the same uh, topic of ornamentation, okay? How about this? My client received an ornamentation refusal. Can I just create a new specimen and submit it to overcome that refusal? This reminds me of Jason talking about legit specimen. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and that's the case here. No, you can't just create a new specimen. Remember, you have to verify that any substitute specimen was in use in commerce at the time of the filing of the application. So that that really restricts you to to uh, to a substitute specimen that sh that is sh uh, you can show in that manner and that you can verify it. So no, you couldn't just make up a new specimen. That wouldn't be legit. Right, not legit, not acceptable. Okay, Jason, for you, um, this is a title of a single work question. Uh, can you give us an example of printed classroom materials that aren't considered a single work? So if a teacher creates a new method of teaching math and writes a book about it, is that considered a single work or not? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Uh... So I think in terms of an example of printed educational material, really we're thinking like maybe like a worksheet, something like that, you know, so if something if someone's going to fill out, maybe it's a, like a, a short test or, or something like that, that sort of thing. If you're writing a book about a brand new thing that you have come up with, that is actually going to be considered a single creative work. 
I understand there's, it's probably a little bit squishy between the two, you know, like, oh, is it a larger pamphlet that I've created, right? You know, like, where does that line fall? I, I can't give you a good um, answer on that, but I think it would be if you are coming up, you've got this new way of teaching math, for example, you know, there's new math, right? And maybe there's new, new math, maybe new, new, new math. I don't know, uh, but you've come up with it, okay? And you've written this book uh, that explains it. Well, that is going to be uh, something that is a single work. Um, so in that case, the title would not necessarily uh, be registrable uh, because it is indicating the, the title of that work. So uh, hopefully that helps a little bit uh, trying to break down. I mean, if you think conceptually about how you sort of go about it, um, is it something that, that changes? Uh, no, um, then it's probably gonna be a, a work. But again, the, the worksheet or something like that would be a, a material that is not at all considered a single creative work. Okay, okay. Um, there, there was a follow-up question about these coloring books and the video game exception to the title of a single work refusal. Why, why would those be exceptions? Do, could you speak on that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So uh, again, I can't tell you why. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. So again, you know, this is going to come out of courts and decisions and, and things like that. Uh, but, you know, these are, I don't, I don't know all the cases they're exactly being pulled from. Uh, but I think we can sort of conceptually think about it. Uh, a coloring book, I think when we typically think about a coloring book, um, that is something that is like a printed, you know, thing that you just color, right? It is not an actual creative work. I know every artist out there is like, Jason, how dare you? Uh, because when I design, uh, you know, this coloring book filled with, you know, playful, you know, raccoons and bunnies, uh, boy, uh, I want my copyright protection uh, for the things that I have drawn. Uh, but it's, it's a situation where it's just, I think, not considered to be creative, but perhaps because the, the person who's filling in the coloring book is doing the creative part. I'm not quite sure. And I think for, for video games as well, uh, it's going to be a situation where, uh, maybe there's so much that's going on in it. There's so many different ways to go about playing it. Um, I don't know. That's a, it's a great question. Um, I guess I, I shouldn't, uh, hypothesize on what the correct answer would be. Uh, but I think it's perhaps helpful to think about the more traditional types of creative works like songs, movies, books, you know, you know, things like that. Uh, and we contrast that with something, especially today's, uh, you know, like uh, video games, which can be these entire uh, worlds where you're just, you know, walking around and, and doing various things in. So that's a great question. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot give you a super precise answer, uh, but my guess is um, it take a little time. We could go in and we could take a look at some of the cases uh, and and come up with fact patterns for, for why the, in those specific, specific cases, uh, the decision came down the way it did. Right, right, okay. Thank you for that. Um, pointing us right back to the case law. That's the best answer. Okay, so here is another question. This is for Kevin. Um, this is a, 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 about columns. Um, why isn't the author of a column the source of the column? Because they seem to be literally the source of the writing. Can you explain why that is different from source in the trademark sense? Well, they certainly are a source of the content of that column, and they can certainly show use as a series. They don't control the, the nature and quality of the column. An editor, a publisher, the per person who owns the newspaper essentially controls that. So they're, they're really just the author of the content, just like they would be of a book or, or, or an artist is the author of a song. So in this case, they don't, you can't really show that they control the quality and nature of the newspaper column, and that's why they would receive that refusal. Okay, thank you. Um, Jason, back to you. Uh, how does registering an artist or band's name apply to those who participate in streaming services? You know, because streaming is like sort of the new normal now, yeah. Well, uh, if it's a streaming service, uh, then it wouldn't necessarily apply uh, because the refusal does not apply to services, right? It's only going to be to goods. Uh, so if it were uh, to be 
you know, the refusal might kick in for something that's like a, a class nine recording of the music. Uh, but if it, you're saying, oh, I'm providing, um, you know, through my website, I, I'm providing, you know, access, not access, we don't really use access anymore, but um, online, non-downloadable, you know, streaming of music or something like that. Well, that that's going to be a service. And so the refusal wouldn't actually kick in for that. Right. So it was sort of a trick question and I'm glad you answered it because sometimes we don't have to do, we don't have to do all the work we think we have to do. <laughs> Not right. applicable there. Okay. Right. Kevin, this is for you. Um, so these days, uh, a lot of artists self publish, right? They produce their own music. They place it on the internet and even actively promote their own works direct to consumer. Isn't that enough to show control over quality of music? Thanks, Marisa. That very may well be enough in this case um, because they can show that they control the quality and nature of the of the content and of the proposed mark. So in that case, it, it is a new world. It is different now, and uh, they're serving the function and role that a traditional publisher uh, would have fulfilled in an earlier world. And so that evidence may very well be enough to overcome that refusal. Okay. Okay. Um, can I add one thing in there oh, too? Please, yes. Uh, so one of the things too with the with the blatancy case, um, if I'm remembering correctly, the um, the applicant was you know it was suggested at multiple times that the applicant could include a verified statement that they you know controlled the quality and nature of the goods. Uh, in that case, the applicant declined to do so. Uh, but that's also one thing to keep in mind, right? You're self producing your stuff. Okay, cool. You can also just include a statement in there, you know, about that. That that'll help with that. So, so you know, the examining attorney is going to be going to be going to be looking for it. And if and if you can truthfully say that, uh, then and you can, it's not too big of a deal to include that in into the into the record. Okay. Um, here's one for Kevin. Okay, so. Uh, here is um, an attendee asking, well, they're saying that they've recorded a number of songs under their pseudonym, and now they want to protect their name so no one uses it. What do they have to do? This is sort of giving us an back a sort of a, a refresher overview of some of the things you've spoken of a moment ago. Right. Well, you know, they, they are, there's a couple of thing, paths that they can take in terms of protecting their name. Um, and. Uh, registering it as a trademark. If they're only using it on recordings, they are going to have to show that they, it's being used on a series of recordings, and they're going to have to show that they control the uh, quality and nature of those recordings, or that they've promoted it as such that that is recognized as a trademark. Otherwise, they're going to receive an author or artist refusal. However, remember, and Jason just talked about this, they're not going to get that refusal for services. So for live musical performances in class 41 or streaming of music, as he just talked about, they're not going to get the refusal for those services and therefore their mark is, is likely to be registrable for those services. Okay. Thank you. Uh... Jason, let's jump into back into the not goods in trade. And this is um, one of those questions about packaging. I think the question itself maybe could requires a little bit of uh, thought here, but I'm going to just yeah. read it to you and you tell me what you think. So here's the here's the question. I want to use my brand on my packaging. But after this discussion, I think my packaging may be considered incidental, not goods in trade. Does this mean I can't use my brand on my packaging? Ah, great question. Uh, no, it does not mean that. That does not mean that at all. And actually, if we think about what the examining attorney is going to be looking for, they're going to want to be seeing you using your brand on the packaging for your goods. The not in the not goods in trade refusal really comes about when what you're applying to register and you have identified in your goods and services is that packaging. Okay, so if the if if what you're doing, let's say that you want to apply, I don't know, you're um, 
your mark is Marisa, uh, right? And you uh, are going to use it for puzzles, okay? Uh, and then you put Marisa as your brand name on your box of puzzles. Well, that's that's fine. The examining attorney is going to want that digital photograph of seeing Marisa on the packaging for your puzzles, okay? And that's a difference, and it really boils down to how do you identify your goods or your services in your application? Do you identify your goods as puzzles, in which case, Cool, that would probably be all right. But if you identify your goods as boxes, well, that's probably gonna be bad, okay? Right, because you're not using it as a brand for boxes, you're using it as a brand for puzzles. So hopefully that clears it up a little bit. We always wanna see good use uh, of a trademark on goods, you know, label, hang tag, packaging for the goods, on the goods themselves, electronic point of sale display. Those are the real traditional sorts of things that we're looking for. So hopefully that clears it up. If not, let me know. I'll try and do a better job. <laughs> so I thought that was helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We probably have time for one more. Um, this is a this is a good question here, Kevin, for you. Uh, if you use a co-pending application that did not get an ornamental uh, rejection or refusal as evidence, to try to overcome an ornamental refusal, must the co-pending application already be allowed? Thanks, Marisa. And in this case, no, it does not have to be allowed at this point. Just merely the co-pending application showing non-ornamental use on other goods and services of the same mark will be sufficient to show secondary source in this case. Okay, 325, what do you think? Do we have time for one more? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do another one. Let's do another. Okay, let's push let's it a little see. bit. Let's push. Okay. Um. Oh, here's one. Uh, this is just a general one, but this goes back to your topic that you spoke about, Jason. So this question: I'm in sales for my own company. Does this constitute services rendered for others? Ah, great question. Uh, so technically, sales is not something that we um. That's not an acceptable identification of uh, of goods and services. Uh, so, to be something that is performed for others, it has to be well performed for others. The sales that you're doing for your company is not a service that you're providing for others. It is a service you're kind of providing for your company, right? So, they, your company is hiring you uh, to do those sales, right? So, uh, in this case, uh, sales would not be something uh, that it would be a service rendered rendered for others. Hopefully that's clear. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, there's a there's a specific TMEP section that speaks specifically to that. That's section 1301.01a, and two, number two, two little eyes there. Okay, yeah. so thank you for that, Jason. Um, here's another one, and I think this one is going to be for Kevin. Um, this is back to the ornament ornamental ornamentation refusals. So here it is. A mark is registered for T-shirts. The original specimen featured the mark emblazoned on the front of the shirt and was accepted without an office action. Will a similar specimen reflecting current use be accepted for a Section A filing? And then it's got another part. Uh, is the ornamentation standard more liberal for Section 8 filings than for initial applications? Wow, that's a good one. That is a good question, Marisa. Thanks. Um, essentially, when the post registration specialist looks at the Section 8 filing, they're still going to apply the ornamentation standard that, that you would find in the, in the TMEP. And despite the fact that it may have been accepted before, it may not be accepted the, the same specimen um, at Section 8 time. Um, while certainly um, that is some sense that, that the examining attorney obviously found it acceptable and did not refuse it as ornamental. They are still going to independently determine that applying the law uh, that that is uh, set. Well, it's 328. What are you thinking, guys? All right, you want to do one more? Let's get one more. One more. Okay. I'm assuming uh, questions. I, I can't see the Q and A, so I'm not sure what all came in. But I'm assuming there's probably uh, at least yeah, one or two in do, there. Yeah, we do. We do. We do. Let's see. I want to make sure there's not one I've I've said. Um, here's a follow up about the pins um, example that you talked about, Jason. Um, well. I don't know if this is a great one, but um, this is in one of the examples about uh, promotional pins as goods. 
it was mentioned that they were sold to dealers. And this um, attendee is asking how, um, I assume, however, that they could still be goods even if they are only given away without charge. So does that, is, does that matter if it's given away for free? Right, it's a great question. Again, uh, <laughs> I can't give you the definitive answer. I can yes, just tell you what sorry. was in the Snap-on case. And in that case, they were sold to uh, dealers who then gave them away. Uh, but I certainly take your point, and I think uh, the general thought sounds right to me uh, that if it is something that has a utilitarian purpose, uh, you know, and it's not part of the typical service that you uh, or sort of good that you provide, uh, then it is something that that could work, right? If we think about calendars, all right, and that was an acceptable thing. I, I don't remember the exact fact pattern in some of the calendar stuff that's out there, uh, but that might be a good place to look and see whether in that case it was required. Oh no, you must sell calendars to a dealer and for them to give away. I don't think that's the case. Uh, and so, but we could always look it up. Um, if you want to have the uh, snap on, I can probably yeah, pull, that pull it up here real us. quick. Thank you. Uh, if you want to see the Okay, so here we go. Down here at the bottom, Snap-on Tools. Uh, you can see the uh, site down at the bottom, 159-USPQ-254. Uh, and you can read it there. And and in that case, they did mention one of the things was that they were sold, you know, across state lines or in commerce uh, to, to dealers. So in, in, in this case, it made a difference to the board. It might be that the board now says, no, we don't care. So long as it has that utilitarian purpose, apart from promotional use, uh, then it might be okay. So uh, that'd be something to to check out if if your client is in one of those situations where hey we've got these things that we give away you know squeezable you know brain uh, things that we give away at trade shows or whatever I don't know uh, but but if it has some other usable thing then maybe you'd be all right so something to look into right because a lot of people have that merch <laughs> right that I... they they want to protect their their brand with merch so okay uh one more huh um... okay. This is like uh, this is back at you, Jason, for for services um, rendering for, rendered for others. Um, this uh, question is about the online groups. So I guess the service has to do with online groups. So for the online groups, a social media page won't work. But what about a private Facebook group? Is that a good? Boy, you're asking me hypotheticals that I can't answer. That's I, I love it. No, I love it. Like, okay, so <laughs> again, I cannot give you a definitive answer, right, on whether or not it would be, but but I think you make an excellent point. Uh, the question it's going to come down to is how are you defining it in your goods and services? So if, like in the FTD case, it was you know creating an online community for dun 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 dun. Uh, I guess technically, if you're making a private Facebook group, you were kind of creating a uh, an online community. Uh, I, I I don't know. Uh, that would sure be pushing it a little bit, I think, because what the board seemed to indicate was the platform provides a community. You can then create a thing in which you are doing things inside that, but it isn't necessarily. Uh, that you are creating the community yourself. You are using tools to create a community given by others in order to kind of create one of your own, right? But also in that case, if you think about, uh, if you see, look at the specimen in terms of what they were actually doing, right? You know, it's it's a Twitter page, right? Where they're trying to pump out information about the various, uh, you know, services that they provide. Hey, you can order your flowers from us uh, for Mother's Day, whatever, you know, uh, you know that sort of stuff. Uh, that's really what the page was about. Um, you know, as opposed to uh, what we're, we were kind of, you know, seeing uh, in the ID and perhaps how we know things work in actual life. So great question. Uh, I'm sorry I can't give you a definitive answer. Uh, but, you know, with all these hypotheticals, you know, <laughs> we have to be careful, too, because, you know, none of us here on the call, as you know, can give legal advice. We cannot tell you, oh, yes, this will be fine. This will be perfect. Right. So <laughs> nothing that we say here today uh, uh, can, can be used against us in the uh, court of the USPTO. Uh, so uh, but they're really in a lot of ways here to help you think. Uh, perhaps about ways to approach it when you get questions from your clients uh, and you're thinking about the best ways to help your clients um, protect themselves and their brand for all the various things that they're doing. Okay. Um, we asked Kevin a question earlier about this T-shirt and the ornamentation refusal. So we got a follow-up. Um, let's see. Regarding Kevin's last answer about Section 8, 
Um, how is it fair to, okay, how is it fair? We don't know, but here we go. How is it, how is that fair to an applicant that has relied on the initial acceptability of the specimen that they have continued to use? Um, ornamentation seems to be a loose refusal, especially with respect to clothing. They seem to be all over the place. So maybe not a, there's a question in there, but maybe um, you could speak to maybe a little bit of the policy. Sure, um, I certainly understand the, the sentiment that uh, the specimen was accepted before. So the, the assumption should be that uh, it would be accepted uh, later on. Um, again, um, we have to look at these independently. And while that would be strong evidence that it was, was acceptable because the examining attorney did accept it uh, previously, the, the specialist in post-registration still has to make that call. And if they feel that that was in error and that this use is, is ornamental, they will refuse it as such. Okay. All right, I think that's all of our questions um, that we've uh, reviewed here. So before we conclude today, and I've really enjoyed this conversation, I wanna take a minute just to say thank you to Jason and Kevin for leading the discussion. I also want to thank attorney uh, Rebecca Miles Isinger and attorney Andrew Bensmiller for helping us answer the questions. Uh, all the queries are coming in through the Q and A. They have been uh, all of the, the all have been providing all of the great responses there. So thank you so much. Both uh, attorney Rebecca Miles Isinger and attorney Andrew Bensmiller serve as senior staff attorneys in the Office of Trademark Quality Review and Training. And then I want to draw your attention to a few reminders. Around 3.30 p.m. today, you should receive an email from Eventbrite that it contains a link to a survey. It should take you about three minutes or so to complete. We always want to hear your feedback, what's working, what's not, so please take a minute and complete that. You'll again receive a link to the presentation slides, and uh, we'll post a recording of this webinar on USPTO.gov and on YouTube in about three or four weeks or so. So my name is Marisa Terrell, and I just want to thank you for joining us today. Visit our webpage for more information on our next Experienced Practitioner webinar. Thanks so much.